1943, a psychologist by the name of Abraham Maslow, you've probably heard of him, he wrote a paper, and I'm sure many of you have studied about, it was called The Theory of Human Motivation. Anybody ever heard of this? The Theory of Human Motivation. Um, or it has been named some other things like the hierarchy of needs. Um, it, it was originally five basic needs that we need to invest our life in or to have met in order for us to function properly. And then, and then over the years, that's developed into eight different things. And, and I want to walk through them with you, and then we'll get to our sneeze for the day. And, and the eight basic needs, the hierarchy of needs that are all of us as humans have, no matter what side of the tracks we come from, our education, our financial, our social level, we all have these basic needs. And number one is our physical needs. And that our physical needs would be met, right? I mean, we have to have that. Uh, this is the very basic elementary level of hierarchy of needs. It's, it's, it's having food on the table. It's, it's, it's basically eat, drink, and be happy. <laughs> it's our physical needs being met. We got a shelter over us. We have water to drink. We have food on the table. Those are the basic needs that we have. Number two is our safety needs. So after our physical needs are met, we want to ensure that our safety needs are being met. Now here's what's interesting, and, 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 and try to put a parenthesis around this because this is going to come into play later in the, in the message. But in America, they say that 85% of the people have their physical needs met. So 85% of Americans at least have food to eat and their physical needs are being met, but 75% have their uh, safety needs being met. Wow. That means even in a room like this, there are some that don't feel safe. There are some that are environments that are not safe. And, and that's a tragedy, isn't it? I don't even think 99% is good enough. How many would agree with me, right? And so number three, the third basic need that we all have is, is our love needs. We all need to be loved. And, and we need to have this feeling of I belong somewhere. I have a group. I have somewhere I can plug into. That was the purpose of family, that we have family, a place to belong, a place to be loved, uh, to be loved, and a place also to give love back. It's a rhythm. It's a flow. You guys tracking with me? Here's what's interesting. Only 50% of Americans have this need met. I'm glad you're moaning on that because it is tragic, isn't it? Now, now, obviously, those of you that are from around here, you already know I'm setting you up for something, don't you, huh? You already know that if we're talking about who we are as a church... We ought to be, if we're going to be the hands and feet of God, come on, let me just lower the boom before we get the rest of them. Then we are the hands and feet. We are the church. Then we ought to be helping meet these needs. Can I please get an amen in the house today, right? Okay, so the love needs. And, um, and it's, why, it's why we do certain things like have uh, life groups. It's why we, have, we break the big group into smaller groups so that we can have those uh, kind of needs met. In fact, I, was, um, I, I, was, uh, I got an email. I didn't actually get the email. Carmen got the email. And uh, I'm going to read it just like it came across. And it says, good morning, beautiful. Now, obviously, that wasn't written to me. And um, I'm a little disappointed. I, none of my emails ever get started off like that. But good morning, beautiful. He says, uh, first, I want to say uh, you have the most beautiful heart ever. Okay, is this going to be about Carmen or is this going to be about life group? No, I'm just kidding. Because watch, watch and see if you can't see the love need right here in this simple two paragraphs. Not only did you make me feel so welcome from the first time I met you, but you leading this small group is one of the reasons I dared to go. The fact that it was on a book that I've been wanting to read is just God sending me a not so subtle nudge. Don't you love how God does that? I grew up in church and have gone for most of my life, and this is from Hillary, by the way, but we did not have a great experience at our last couple of churches. It was the last place I felt I could be myself. That's sad, isn't it? Yeah. And I swore off making more friends, especially women, 
a couple years ago because I was just so hurt and never being loved for who I actually was. So needless to say, I fought God tooth and nail on joining a small group, but the nudge was too strong, and I knew I needed to listen to that pull. And wow, after our first meeting, I added several of our group's girls on social media and have already had amazing conversations and connections with several of them. I'm in awe of the way in which it opened my heart and my life so much in less than a week. I was trying to do life way too alone, and gosh, I'm seeing how much that's not God's design to do. Woo-wee. I just want you to know how much I appreciate you and your family and how thankful I am that we found Radius. It's the most I've ever felt at home at church, and, I, and like I can show up at, um, as myself, nothing more and nothing less. Come on. Isn't that great, everybody? Isn't that good? <laughs> Hillary, thank you for sharing that thing. I see leaky eyes over there. I think I do. But thank you for sharing that because that, that's the love need. We, we have this sense we have to love and we have to be loved if we're going to be all that we can be or be who God has designed us to be. Now, I'm, I'm leading to our next sneeze, so hang with me. Uh, after the, the love need, we have number four is the esteem needs. The esteem needs is to be recognized. We all want to be recognized. We want to be noticed. We, we, we want to know that we're important to somebody. It, it's why we, we, we love compliments. It, it, it's why we have mirrors, everybody. Come on now, right? It's a, and, and, and too many people, what happens is they get stuck on these four right here. Um, but, but already you can start seeing how we as a church and the people of God can make sure these needs are being met in people's lives. And, and we can meet these. And, and once these four are fulfilled, we can move to the next four. Now let's look at the next four. Number five is our cognitive needs. Our cognitive needs are that we have this appetite to understand. That's why we have classes that on Wednesday night, because I want to understand. I'm serving God. God saved me, but I want to dig into that. How, what's this Bible thing? How do I read this Bible? We have these cognitive needs to understand. Come on, man. It's why we take things apart from the day we're born, right? <laughs> you can't put them back together, but at least I know how it was, you know, right? Okay. It's, it's, <laughs> I heard a woman say amen, all right? <laughs> that, that was dirty pool right there, I'm telling you, all right? So it's why, it's why we watch things like documentaries and, and just learn how things are made. Number six is our aesthetic needs. And, uh, and this is just the need to see and appreciate beauty. It, it's the need to make things better. It's the need. It, it's why we mow yards. <laughs> it's, why we, it's why we travel to the Grand Canyon and just stand there and go, wow. You know, that's why. Uh, I used to, once a year, take a Harley ride across America and take all the back roads. And, and take seven to ten days to do that and, and just look at all the scenery. We have that in us. Now, here's where it gets interesting, and this is where I really want you to lean into. Number seven is uh, our self-actualization needs. Self-actualization needs. Now, this is to realize why you're made. This is when you begin to discover the purpose of life. This is when you begin to discover that there is a creator and I am his creation and he created me and put a plan and a purpose. Psalms 139, that he put something in me. He's gifted you with something. He's given you a certain personality. And if you don't know that, we as a church can help you get to number seven, the self-actualization needs. Here's what's sad about this. And what's sad about this is that only 2% of America's population knows why I'm here and realize their potential. That's sad. And the reason it's sad is because then the percentage is going to go down in just a minute on the next one. So in 1943, they stopped with these seven. And I think it was around 19, uh, somewhere between 68 and 80 that they added this last one because they realized that life really wasn't fulfilled just when we found out why we're made. But number eight is what's called the transcendence need. 
And uh, do I have number eight there? Transcendence need. And this is when we look beyond ourselves and begin to pour ourselves into somebody else. And this is the highest level of living. And this is the level of living that we get the most health from, that we get the most benefit from, and that we get the most fulfillment from. Can I get an amen in the house? All right. Now, watch why this is important. The self actualization need, if only 2% of the world's population knows that, then even less move to number eight. Come on. What would it look like if 100% of those of us that call ourselves followers of Jesus understood why we were made and 100% of us turned that around and poured that into somebody else that was somewhere else on the chart? Woo, come on now. Are you hearing that today? And, and so, I, and, and I think this, I, I think that God could just really do something tremendous. And let me take a little side note. A little side note is this. I believe this. Right now, it's amazing. Uh, we got 20-year-olds coming to our church like crazy. Anybody in that like 18 to 24-year-old in this first service? They usually come to the second service. Yeah, I get it. All right. Way to go. woo There you go. There you go. There you go. All right. Anyway, let me just say something real quick right here. I think that this age group, 18 to 25, I think they're the ones that are going to change our community. No, no, no bad on the 50, 60, 70, 80 year olds in the place, but there is just something about this generation right now. They don't really care too much about image. They don't really care too much about what people think of them, not as much as you think they do. And they're willing to take their insufficiencies and their sufficiencies and leverage them for the benefit of somebody else. And that's what God will use to change a world. Come on and say amen to that. They're not embarrassed about who they are. And, and, and this transcendence needs is the ultimate level of fulfillment. It's when, it's when we start showing compassion. It's when we start showing uh, uh, sympathy. It's when we start showing care. It's when we ultimately understand who we are so that we're not insecure in helping somebody else get to a higher level because we're good enough with where we're at. Come on. Oh, man, I'm already preaching, and some of you are still waking up. Come on now. It's like this. When I'm preaching, and I see, see, when I'm preaching right now, I see a lot of little emojis over your heads. Some of you got a little yawn emoji going on, and I'm, like, ticked off about that. That's why I get loud. And some of you have little praying hands emoji. That's pretty cool. I like that. All right. Patty's not here today. She's visiting her dad. She usually has a little salsa dancer emoji going when I'm preaching. I, I kind of dig that. That's kind of cool. And, and, and some of you have question marks floating over your head. But really what it fires me up is when I'm preaching and I see those little question marks turn into light bulbs. Woo, come on. And then I get a little halo. Come on, everybody, right? Uh, I mean, right? <laughs> but it's, it's when we're in God, when we're operating in who God created us to be, that there's just this level of living, that there's no job, there's no money, there's no paycheck that can do anything to touch even close to what it is when you're living in transcendence. Transcendence is this. Uh, it, it, let me give a, have a working definition. Exceeding usual limits. I want to be a world changer. I want to be a history maker. But the only way I'm a history maker is not to look out for me, but to leverage my pain, uh, leverage my story, leverage my talents, leverage all about me to help somebody else in their journey. Yeah, I'll just wait for you. I mean, I'll just... Come on, and, and, and extending beyond the limits of ordinary experience or to surpass. Wow. I don't know. It's just the older I get, the more I want my life to last longer than just my years on this earth. Does that make sense? Um, and so here's the idea. You could have come to this church today and you're at any one of those eight levels. You might be at level one. You might be at level two. You might be, uh, give me that list back. I know I'm going to mess you up, but you, you might be at one of those other, you might have come here today and you're just looking for your love needs to be fulfilled because you're not getting that anywhere else. And you ought to be able to come to the church of Jesus Christ and have that fulfilled, right? But what I'm saying is you could be anywhere on that list, but our goal for you, for, forget that, my goal for you. Even forget that. God's goal for you is not to stay at whatever number you're at, but to get to the number eight. Because when you're at number eight, it fulfills all the containers of all the other ones. Come on, everybody. 
And watch this. It's, it's not just you could show up at any one of these levels and follow me on the vision of maybe having a dream center. It's why I'm not interested in a soup kitchen. It's why I'm not interested in a shelter. I'm interested in a dream center where somebody will spend a year of their life with us so we can disciple them and help them and watch. We can meet their physical needs. Come on. And we can meet their safety needs. Hello, somebody. And we can begin to meet their love needs because we are the hands and feet of Jesus. And if Jesus was here in the flesh, that's what he would be doing. And I think he's looking for a hands and feet that will do what he would be doing if he was here. Amen, everybody. Okay, you say, well, Ken, you said all of that stuff. What does that have to do with a sneeze? Well, I'm glad you asked. We're in this series about sneezing, and the whole idea is that a sneeze gets rid of an infection that could create disease in our life, or at least unhealth. And so the whole premise of the series is to guard for those things that would cause death, or inactivity, uh, or, or viruses, or invaders in the body of Christ, to sneeze that out and replace it with something else, all right? And so uh, with that in mind, let's go to our theme verse, and we'll do a little bit of recap, and we'll do today's sneeze. Second Kings chapter number 4, here's where it comes from. When Elisha reached the house, remember there's a little boy dead. When he reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on the couch. There's a whole world that is spiritually dead, right? There's a whole world that's at number one and number two and number three. In other words, they're paralyzed because their safety needs, their physical needs, their love needs. All those needs aren't being met. He went in and he shut the door on the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and he lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eye to eye, hand to hand. I've already explained all that. As he stretched himself out on him, the boy's body grew warm. Then he did what I normally do. I pace when I pray. Elijah turned away and walked back and forth in the room and then got on the bed and stretched out on him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. So we're getting something out that's expelling death or invaders and replacing it with life. Just a little bit of repeat, just in case you weren't here. These messages are all self-contained. In part number one, we just did the alignment. In part number two, which was sneeze number one, we sneezed out isolation and replaced it with relationship. We read that story today. I'm glad at least somebody in the house is sneezing out isolation mm -hmm, and replacing it with relationship. Number, sneeze number two is we're sneezing out the usual for the unusual. In other words, we're going we're gonna to take at least a baby step outside of our comfort zone. Number Sneeze number three is that we're going to sneeze out polarization for an open circle. And then today, sneeze number four is I want us to consider sneezing out our pain and replacing it with purpose. Mm, are you ready for it? <laughs> uh, um, now, in, I, I want us to quit using our pain and our hurts and the things that have happened bad to us as an excuse to lie dormant on the couch. I want us to learn that God takes not just the good in our life, come on, but the bad in our life and the stories of our life. And some of you got some really bad stories. How many know what I'm saying, right? But don't hide from those stories and don't hide from those scars and don't hide from that pain. Those pain, those scars, they're your trophies of God's grace and God wants to use that. Come on, everybody. And so it, it, even in my life, there's a few things that you see that I do around here, and it's because some of the pain in my life. When I was nine years old, I was going to be water baptized, and I wanted my mom to come see me. My mom didn't come to church with me. She showed up to see me being water baptized, and they wouldn't let her in the back door. They wouldn't let her in the door because she was dressed inappropriate. And, you, and, and sometimes you wonder, why do they do these spontaneous water baptisms? Uh, because I want, no matter how you show up, we're throwing a party and nothing's going to get in the way, right? What I'm saying, everybody, is, is sometimes it's your past that you've got to be willing to go ahead and leverage it for your future. There's different things. We make sure every kid that comes to church here gets a present. Because the night my mom was going to commit suicide, my church showed up with Christmas presents and groceries and led my mom to the Lord. That memory is 
still sunk deep in me. What if our kids' best memories are being in church, not their worst memories? Come on, right? One of the reasons I, uh, I'm so fanatic about men's ministry and men's life groups is because I grew up with father wounds, and, and I know what it is to be insufficient in all those areas. All I'm saying is instead of hiding from the pain, hiding from the bad things, come on, let's leverage that. Let's sneeze out the pain and replace it with purpose because God has purpose for everybody and there is pain in everybody. Come on, right? Now, let me, before I go a little further, let me do a little asterisk here. I've had a couple conversations during this series uh, directly with some people. And if you're in the room, thank you for letting me use you, but I won't call your name. And some people have said that, that they think what I'm preaching is that I'm telling you to do more. Some people think, oh, man, he's just telling us to do more. Well, remember, I gave you the warning that this is about rallying the body of Christ. Now, if you think this series is about you doing more, you're missing it, and I'm not communicating right. It's not about you doing more. It's about challenging you to do something that has eternal value. How many know that's a world different? Sometimes i got to do less so I can do what's most important. I'm not trying to burden you with more stuff. I'm not, I'm not asking you to do more. I'm just asking you to consider, are you spiritually laying on the couch uh, or are you the one that is stretching hand to hand, mouth to mouth, eye to eye and doing the work of God? Right? That, that's what I'm talking about. So, so and, and, and in today's particular message, don't let what has hurt you in one season rob you from the rest of your life. Don't let what happened on one bad day be part of every day for the rest of your life, everybody. Let's sneeze out the pain and let's replace it with purpose, right? Mm. See, see, you don't need more to do. That's not what this series is about. There's not a person in this room that needs more to do. Uh, everybody's busy. Everybody's in a hurry. You don't need more to do for God to love you more. That is not the point. But if you leverage the hurt in your life, it will bring healing to you. It will bring fulfillment to you. Come on now. It's a trick on the devil. See, the devil wants you to sit back and say, oh, I can't be friendly because somebody, you know. But if you turn that around and you leverage what the devil meant for bad and use it for God's glory, it's playing a trick on the devil. Come on. It's punching him with his own fist. I like that. All right? And so today, I don't want to oversimplify the message, um, and, and I don't usually like messages that are loaded up with just lists, uh, but I'm going to do that today. I'm going to break one of my own rules, and I just want to give you some lists to consider, because I want you, here's what I've asked God to do, that he would just put on your heart one out of the next list I'm going to give you, on how do I find the purpose in my life. There's a whole lot of super intelligent people. You run businesses, you run families, but you're still not in God's purpose in your life. And I get asked that question a lot. And I can't tell you what God's purpose is in your life. I can help you understand why you're wired the way you are and what personality you are and what spiritual gifts you are. But only you pressing into God can discover God's purpose for your life. And one more time before I give you the list, one more time I want to say, quit disqualifying yourself because of your past. It might be your past that is the thing that qualifies you for the people or the person or the group that God is waiting for somebody to be a Christ ambassador to. So here's our list. If you're looking to try to find purpose, number one, this is a simple list, easy to preach, hard to do, just like last week. Number one is you got to reprioritize your life. Mm -hmm. I know it's simple. I, I know you're adults, and, and you don't want to be told this, but um, let's just consider it anyway, all right? When I say reprioritize your life, I don't know what you do with your life, and I don't know all that, so I'm not here to put numbers on anything except number one. Come on now. Number one is you got to put God first. We cannot put God second, third, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, and expect that we're going to discover God's purpose in our life. See, one of our goals is that we will help you discover purpose. And one of the things, the preludes to discovering purpose is you got to prioritize your life where you are putting God number one in your life. Come on, everybody. How I many know just because you come to church doesn't mean God's number one in your life? How I many know just because you pray doesn't mean God's number one in your life? 
Huh? Would you elbow somebody and say, he's talking to you also. Just, could you do that? All right. I just feel like you're a little quiet on me today. All right. Matthew chapter number six. I'm just messing with you guys. Matthew chapter number six. It says this, but seek. Yeah, see, you you can't even say the word, can you? Come on. Let's do it together. But seek. That's a little better. Let's try it one more time with a little gusto. All right. But seek. Okay, now there you go. Now, either we believe the Bible or we don't. Because here's the promise. If then, if you seek him first, then, come on now, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that we're running around clamoring for, trying to get all these things, they will be given to you as well. Why? Because when you honor God as the first in your life, it's called the law of first. And I'm just throwing it out there as a challenge. Is he really first? Well, obviously, he's the first of your week. You're sitting here today. Is he the first of every day? Is he the first of your paycheck? Is he the first thought that you go to? Is he the first one you talk to? Is he the first priority in your heart? Is every other decision in life based on not moving him out of first? Hmm. Are you glad you came today? (laughs) Remember, this series is about getting rid of something and replacing it with something else. So sometimes I don't have room for more in my life. And that's why some of you are feeling the pressure. Oh, I got to do more. I got to do more. No, 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 no. You need to sneeze something out and rearrange the priority that he's number one. Come on, everybody. Right? Let me just give you a simple example. Instead of listening to the news on the drive to work, why not listen to worship on the drive to work? See, it's about getting rid of one thing and reprioritizing the other thing, right? Okay? And and so get the word inside of you. We, We don't have to be everything, but God made you to be something. And too many of us are satisfied with being just paying the bills. You're not supposed to be everything. But God did make you to be something. And you'll never discover what that something is without making him number one. You see, we say we will will help you find purpose here. But watch this. And we'll help you discover what your spiritual gifts are. But we understand that maybe being a greeter in the church isn't like your ultimate purpose in life. But it's the first step to your purpose. It's the first step to discovering, oh, this is how God made me. It's, and, and when you're faithful in little things, come on now. He'll make, some of you are waiting for some big Shazam moment, but you won't take the ordinary day because you're too busy waiting for the extraordinary day. Oh, I got to get off this. All right. <laughs> See, as you go through one door, then God opens another door. And we're waiting for door number five, but we haven't even gone through door number one. We got to reprioritize our life. Uh, and, and, and sometimes, watch this, everybody. Sometimes the reprioritizing is just taking the priority off me and looking just for a good deed to pour into somebody else. Here's what it says in 1 Timothy chapter number 6. It says this. Watch this verse. Now, Paul, Paul is telling Timothy, who's getting ready to pastor his church. So Paul is Timothy's pastor, and Timothy's now a young pastor. And Paul is telling Timothy, don't forget to preach this stuff right here. That's what he's saying. Command them. Now, I've never been able to command you to do anything. <laughs> it's like herding cats, all right? I mean, I just <laughs> command them to do good. I'm just messing around. Command them to do good. That's where he starts. Hey, tell your church to do good. To be rich in good deeds. Ooh. And to be generous and willing to share. Somebody came in here today with a love need. And it's not going to take but another 30 seconds for you to fulfill and be generous and give that love need. Come on now. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Oh, that's a lot of stuff. So that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Do you get that? That's where life really is. This is transcendence right here. All right? Next week is an example. Next week, we're going to be doing our second, which will be every month now, our lunches for our uh, New Earth Recovery and our recovery homes. Uh, Are any of our New Earth or any of our recovery people in the house today? Can we just see you and celebrate you? All right. They slept in too. Okay. I think they run the bus during this one anyway. But we love them. And it's just a simple way to serve 
them. Reprioritize your life. Let me give you one more verse. Um, um, uh, one more verse is this. Uh, they share freely and give generously to those in need. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. They will have influence and honor. All right? Uh, can you go back to my list? Because I forgot to announce number two. So uh, reprioritize your life and then find a place to be connected and to serve. I forgot to give you that. But that, that's that scripture. Just find a place to be connected. You don't have to have a lanyard. You can just love somebody. You can just encourage somebody, right? Okay, number three then is live life intentionally. Just live life intentionally. Now watch this. Determine what are your values. There's a lot of people that say this to me. Oh, man, I just want to have a good marriage. And I say, okay, that's great. That's your value. That's a value. Now, um, are you living with that intention? In other words, let me say it a different way. Check your goals and check your behavior and make sure they match. Because a lot of people tell me they love God, but I never, ever, ever see them in the house of God, serving God, praying, reading their Bible. Come on. Right, everybody? Now, now listen, friends. Uh, uh, if, if you say that your marriage is a priority, then live with that intention. If you want to raise godly kids, then live with that intention, right? you got to live life intentionally. we got to quit letting life happen to us. Set your values, set your goals, and point all your energy, all your time, all your finance, all your resource toward the values of your life. Because you'll never accidentally get to where you're wanting to go. Come on now. Ephesians 4.1 says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. What has God put on your heart? Now aim your life that way. Quit living by default and live by design. Number four. Number four is consider that your purpose may be found in your pain. Your purpose. Some of you are here and you're waiting to get all healed up before you do anything for anybody. And I understand that. Sit and, and get as much healing as you need. But here's something I've learned in life. You stumble up to the batting cage with all your wounds. And as you're trying to help somebody else, it's supernatural that God will help you. Yeah. Did you hear? I didn't ask anybody to say amen there, but you heard it throughout the crowd. Yeah. Now watch this. How many of you have ever heard of Father Abraham, the father of our faith? You guys know him? He's the father of our faith. God promised him that he could have the land of Canaan, which was the promised land. It flows with milk and honey, all that kind of stuff. If you follow his story real careful, though, it's interesting. Because in, instead of singing Father Abraham, we could have been celebrating his father. But his father didn't go lay claims on the blessings because of pain that was in his life. He allowed the pain to keep him. In other words, if you grew up in church, you grew up singing Father Abraham. Anybody remember this song? Father Abraham. And like, if you've seen that and you didn't know what was going on, it's like, whoa, that is weird, right? And, and, and watch. But we could have been not singing Father Abraham. We could have been singing Father Tara. Because God made the promise to Abraham's father. But because of pain in his life, his father never followed through to the blessings. I want to say to you, do not let your pain keep you held as a prisoner, but leverage it for the glory of God. Let me show it to you real quick in Scripture. Genesis chapter number 11. I love this story. It says, this is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram. There he is. Nahor and Haran. So he has these three sons. And Haran became the father of Lot. You guys no lot. Remember his wife turned into the pillar of salt because he went with a... Okay, you got that. While his father, Terah, was still alive, watch this, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. So he had a son that died. Haran, his son, died. Check this out. Keep on going. It says, so Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot and son of Haran and his daughter-in-law, Sari. And the wife of his son Abraham, who later became Sarah. And together they set out for Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan, the promised land, the blessings of God. But watch what happens. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. You just can't help but get caught in the metaphor. He has a son named Haran that dies. They're on the way from where they were to the blessings of God. 
And they come into a land that represents the hurt of the loss and the death. And they settle there instead of going on to the place that God has for them. I just wonder how many people settle in their pain and forever are a victim and never move into the purposes of God. It could have been all about Terah, but Terah settled in his pain and he lived 205 years and he died. He died in his pain instead of dying in the flow, instead of dying in the blessing. Come on, everybody. Terah could have been. Um, here's something I know in life, and, and some of you will get this. Here's what I know. Everyone dies, but not everyone lives. Everyone's born, but not everybody lives. Some are still breathing, but you haven't really began to live because you've not got to number seven or eight on the list. Come on now. Which brings me to number five. Number five is leverage your story. Just leverage your story. I, I think it'll be a happy day in heaven when we quit being ashamed of where we've come from. When we quit being ashamed of, well, I did this in the past, and I did this in the past, and if you've seen the skeletons in my closet, no, we want to see the skeletons. Because it lets me know that I don't, I'm not perfect, and, and I don't have to hide my stuff because you don't hide your stuff. Come on. And that we're all, I, I like Jake said it Wednesday night, I think he was quoting a great preacher, I'm not sure, but we're, there's no big potatoes or small potatoes, we're all just mashed potatoes. Come on, right? We all came through the same door of grace. We all have bents and we all have brokenness and we all have hurts and we've all shed tears and we've all been let down. I love this verse that I've just been resonating with me lately. It's not on the screen, but it's in Revelation chapter number 12 and here's what it says. It says they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the words of their, somebody said it, testimony. So how do we become overcomers in life? Well, first step is the blood of the Lamb. First step is Jesus in our life. But the second step in overcoming, in other words, in having victory, is the words of your testimony. Being able to verbalize, here's where I'm at, here's what I've done, here's what I've been through. And the more you share that, the more you have victory over it, and it doesn't have victory over you. Come on, everyone. So, so what is your unique story? Everyone in this room has a unique story. And some of you are like, well, mine's not that bad. It's not really that spicy and all that colorful, you know. That's good. That's a great story, too. I was listening to Jake on Wednesday night, and, and one of the things I realized is, is like, Jake doesn't have, like, you know, I, you know, I, I uh, you know, had ten marriages and did every drug known to man before I was five years old. He doesn't have a story like that. He grew up in a Christian home, had a great mom, had a phenomenal father. I mean, he, you know, I have feelings when you laugh. Thank you. I got one amen in the room from my buddy. All right. Lunch is on me today, Jake. All right. But, but like, he, he, didn't, he doesn't have what, what we might consider in our world a spicy testimony. But he came into a season in his life where he doubted this God that his dad preached about all the time. And he needed to discover this God for himself. And so he had some doubts. And his doubt caused him to dig deeper. And because of that doubt and digging deeper and that pain and that discomfort, he's now up here helping others know God at a deeper level. Use your pain. Come on, everyone. And so, and, and so here's the question. What story do you want to write? Are you going to let the pain write your story? Or are you going to be the narrator of the pain and write the story? Oh, man. Well, when, when, when I was wanting to quit ministry back in 2011, I thought about what people would say about me. I started thinking weird things like, what are they going to say at my funeral? Oh, he did some things, but I don't ever know what happened to him. I don't ever know why he just quit and ran out of gas and all that kind of stuff. All right? Leverage your story, everyone. Leverage. I just want this to be the day that you quit saying, no, I don't have anything. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. If one person will get fired up on this today, I'll be happy. Number six is then look for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Look for the opportunity. Uh, and and, and I, God can open doors that man cannot shut. Right? Um, uh the devil will always lie and tell us things like, you know, you don't have the time, you don't have the talent, all that. Um, 
Okay, maybe that's true. I don't have any more time, Ken. I just can't do more. But just, just look for how can you encourage somebody. Did you come to church today and high-five anybody and tell somebody you were glad they were here? Come on, everybody. I mean, it's just like, just look for oper- look for little things, and as you do little things, God will give you more things. Just, just I, I always say this. I want you to wear a lanyard, but you don't have to wear a lanyard to see an opportunity, right? I love the story. I've told it before, but Mary Ann Bird was born in Brooklyn on August 1928. She had a cleft palate. She had 17 surgeries, and in all of that, she never gained hearing in, uh, I think it was her, one of her ears, left ear, I don't remember, but, but her classmates would make fun of her. And then the day came, some of you will remember this, I remember this, there was the day in school that you took the hearing test. Anybody remember hearing tests at school? Okay, like a few of you do. Some of you didn't hear, there was a test. All right, so anyway... <laughs> But I'm bing. All right. So, uh, <laughs> and, and this is where you would go up to the teacher's desk and the teacher would say, whisper something to you, and then you had to repeat it back. <laughs> it's such a primo, t- you know, like, wow, that's how you did it. So, so she put her hand around her good ear, Marianne Bird did, and waited for the humiliation because she couldn't hear good. And she knew her friends or students, rather, would make fun of her. But as she leaned real close to Miss Leonard's desk, She leaned across the desk, and Miss Leonard whispered directly into Mary Ann's good ear. And she said, I wished you were my little girl. She didn't have to wear a lanyard to do that. Come on, somebody. Just look for an opportunity. Look for someone that's alone. Look for somebody that's struggling. In the parking lot, you see that grandma trying to load those groceries in the rain? You big, strong men, shame on you. Get your butt out there and load them groceries. Can I get an amen? Let me do the last one. No, let me do two more. Number seven. Just show up. Show up in life. Show up. Show up to your life. Show up. Just... Did you get that? Show up. Just It's your life. You got to show up in it. Quit waiting for everybody else to show up in your life. You show up in your life. We talk about this all the time in our family that the miracle isn't just showing up. I don't know what's going to happen in church today, but I'm going to be there. Just in case. I don't want to miss out. Uh, I mean, Ken could finally fall off the stage, and I don't want to miss that. I just, I got to be there. Um, Bill, I, I got the wonderful privilege of being close to Bill Bright before he died. And when he was in his 80s, he had a billion soul goal to reach a billion souls for the glory of God. Him and Billy Graham were like the two just amazing people in our time. And Bill Bright, he's the Campus Crusade for Christ, all the Christian movies and all, all that kind of stuff. And, 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 and I got to be close to him. And one day, anyway, he called me and he asked me if I could come down to his house in Orlando on the National Day of Prayer and pray with him and a handful of other pastors. There's about six of us. And, uh, and I didn't really want to do it. Like, man, I could pray here, you know, God be with them, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, that's an expensive prayer. How many know what I'm talking about? But, you know, when people like Billy Graham and Bill Bright and Tommy Barnett's of life, when they call, you're like, okay, I'm going to do that because there's something in them that I want in me. And I want to just honor that in their request. So I got on an airplane. I flew down there, went to his condo. There we sat at breakfast on the National Day of Prayer. We're six of us eating breakfast, and the phone rings. He answers the phone by pushing a button. That's an old-fashioned phone where you push these buttons. (laughs) And a speaker came on. And it was George W. Bush. And I got to sit there and pray over the leader of our nation. Now, he wouldn't spit on me now if I was on fire. He don't know me. But here's what I know. I know that I got maybe a little bit of prayer that got to affect a world leader. The miracle was in showing up. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I wouldn't have had that experience. I wouldn't have seen the opportunities that open if I just didn't show up. Here's something that we need to remember. The path of least resistance never gets us where we want to go. And there's a lot of people on the path of the least resistant. Mm, mm -mm. The score of the game doesn't change until you're down there in the red zone. And the defense gets meaner down there, right? Let me give you the last one. 
I think this one's important. Feel the fear and do it anyway. <laughs> feel the fear. Oh, I don't know if I can do this. I know. Feel the fear and do it anyway. There are people that think I'm this extremely confident, courageous person. If you really knew underneath it all, I'm a wimp. I'm scared of everything. I'm scared of failing. I'm scared of criticisms. I'm, I'm a, everything I do in life started and was rooted first in fear. Um, what if you would start running towards something instead of running from it? What if you run from the things that are always intimidating? I wonder what's on the other side of that intimidation. And if you run from things that are always intimidating, you'll be running all your life. Let me give you this in a real practice because some of you are thinking pie in the sky. So, no, no, no. When you see somebody you don't know, even in church, and you're like, oh, I want to go say hi to them, but what if they've been here for six years and I ask them if it's their first time? Oh, how intimidating. <laughs> I do it all the time. <laughs> Pastor, I was at your birthday party for crying out loud, you know. <laughs> That's intimidating. Yes. Do it anyway. Amen. Feel the fear yeah. and do it anyway. Amen. I close with an illustration out of my life. I got a picture I think we could show. Last week I showed me and my mom. This is me and my dad. I don't know why I put those up there, because every time I turn around, I feel like I'm going to start crying. This was one of our first rides together. We built both of those Harleys together. And, uh, but that would have never happened if I wouldn't have felt the fear and done it anyway. Because I didn't grow up with my dad, and I didn't know him, and I was told all kind of lies about him. And I thought I'd never want to meet this guy, but then I became a father, and there was this emptiness in me. My son Jake was 11 months old. He and Patty and I got on an airplane from Michigan, and for the first time since I was four years old, flew to this crazy state where it rains all the time. <laughs> I landed in Seattle, got on another plane, and flew up to Bellingham, where he had never left. And in Bellingham, especially in the older days, you, they parked the plane out on the tarmac, and you'd go down the stairs, and you'd walk toward the terminal outside. You guys, some of you remember that. And I'm going to tell you right now, when I was walking toward that tarmac, the, the glass in front of me was tented, and I knew he was on the other side of that glass. And I remember trying to walk down the stairs of that airplane. My legs got weak, and I, my heart was beating so hard I could hear, because I'd been told all my life, he doesn't love you. He wants nothing to do with you. He's an atheist. Now you're going to show up as a preacher, son. I'm carrying my son. I'm walking across that tarmac, getting closer and closer to that glass. And in my mind, let me tell you what's going on in my mind. In my mind is if, if I knew he wasn't watching, I'd turn around right now and go hide. If I could, I'd get right back on that airplane and I would offer that pilot all the money in the world to take off and fly me back. Because every step I took, the enemy was right there saying, this is going to be a disaster. And I started saying, man, what do I say? What, do I call him dad? Do I say hi? Do I hug him? Do I shake his hand? All of these thoughts, all of these lies, all of this fear, all of this adrenaline, all of this anxiety... But I learned then, as I've learned with everything in life, feel the fear yeah. and do it anyway. I went in that sound booth before the church service today. I told my son, I said, hey, just pray for me. I'm having some anxiety today. You see, you look up here and see somebody that's confident and raring to go. No, feel the fear yeah. and do it anyway. And see what God does with your weakness. Amen, everybody? Come on, let's sneeze it out.